it's now time for Ophelia Delroy. Let me introduce her. She's a professor of philosophy of mind at Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich and a member of the Graduate School in Systemic Neuroscience in Munich. I let the floor. Hi, thank you. Can I uh, start sharing my screen maybe? Yes. Yes. Okay, you should see it now, right? Correct. Okay, great. Well, thank you for, for the invitation. And um, it was a great pleasure to, to listen to the uh, previous talks. And, and I hope um, my perspective will also bring another, uh, only a slice of the cake, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid, but another uh, slice and maybe the sort of dark matter of some of the conversations I think that many people have had uh, about the shift to digitalization and this idea of the digital trauma that uh, Caroline has invited us to reflect upon. Um, the various questions that one can ask uh, uh, with COVID I think is relative to this, this trauma idea that is the, the idea of a painful trace that uh, our experiences during the time of COVID will have on our emotional lives or, um, uh, social, or social lives or cognitive uh, um, capacities and uh, the word of art as well. So the, um, and the word of art it being both an object uh, of, of trauma and, and one way of capturing um, these experiences. But I'm, um, want to shift the, the question uh, a bit to reflect more about this second question about the subjective trace that will be left out for digital experience. So we have transitioned um, to the digital spaces uh, even more than we used to, to live more of our um, professional lives, social lives, family lives, um, and also shifted our aesthetic enjoyments online. And I want to interrogate with the perspective of philosophy and cognitive science, this idea of the memory that will be left uh, of these experiences that we had online. But more than the memory, I'm interested in what this memory of digital experience is likely to leave out. And I think that um, Ito, you actually uh, mentioned that there is a tendency to gravitate to this scrolling of experience where at the top of our finger, we can go from one museum to the next, one person to the next, one context to the next. And um, this scrolling is likely to actually uh, shape our memory as, and especially leave out uh, a variety of experiences that otherwise uh, we would have remembered in real life. In a way, I want to question this uh, sentence that has become a very popular meme that the internet never forgets. Uh, maybe the traces that we leave on the internet are um, there forever, but um, if the internet never forgets, we certainly forget it and forget it more easily than we forget real life experiences. It's very interesting that in the discussion about this digitalization, we focus on sometimes the direct interaction and not the long-term consequences of having gravitated towards uh, screens more and more. And here there's been um, uh, an abundant literature and series of studies comparing what happens when we read exactly the same text on a screen or on paper. So I guess that um, in the room there will be people who are still like me, uh, aficionados of the good old fashioned books and do not consume their news uh, or the novels on, on iPads. But most of the contents that we scroll for news, for instance, have gravitated online. So what you can do with laboratory studies um, is to actually present exactly the same content on these two formats. And series of studies have shown that our reading times or our comprehension are not really affected throughout these two formats. But one thing which consistently uh, is, is revealed by the studies is that our memory for the content we've read online or on paper are different. And we remember better what we've experienced on the physical object than on the screen. There is another aspect which I find even more worrying and I think deserving of attention is that 
beside our memory, it's our capacity to regulate our learning. So usually when you say you have to study for an exam, you read your textbook. And at some point you're capable of saying when you have learned, when you remember enough that content to close the book. Now we do that uh, smoothly on paper, but when we con consume contents online, then this capacity to self-regulate our learning and our absorption of content is much less accurate. We spend too little time uh, reading the content for what our memory performance can be. Of course, this uh, uh, data are, are very problematic to handle and to draw lessons uh, from because in a way they're relative to a generation and the, the type of arguments that one can always have is to say that as digital natives gravitate more and more on their learning activities and their self-regulation online and maybe they will be able to uh, accommodate this uh, uh, challenge and, and show the same level of performance than we did on paper. But I think these studies miss something very important is that the content that they have been looking at are also sort of digital native contents in the sense that text is easy to implement from a book to a screen. What is really important is to think about the content and the type of uh, um, conceptualization that we have for what we are putting on, on the screens and what we are uh, experiencing on the screen. It's not just text, but a variety, as, as Vittorio was saying, a variety of visual uh, experiences. So what happens to the memory of, of these experiences, which are not words, but images or um, social events or um, discussions, conversations, listening to a concert? What happens to these digital experiences when it comes to our memory? And one set of very robust findings that we have uh, accumulated over the years when you study memory is to show that actually when we present contents through a limited number of sensory media, um, is it just visual or audiovisual, then the memory is less good and less accurate than the experience of the same content when surrounded by a rich context. And the rich context is the context of our own body, the context of the temperature in the room, the smell, um, the, the, um, the sounds that are accidental uh, when we move around, and so on and so forth. So we know, for instance, that if, if our exercise is to remember faces, we will be much better if we also are provided with the voices, uh, even if, if really what we're trying to remember is only the visual aspect. And when it comes to museums, one thing which I've been working a lot with, with various museums, is to think about this multisensory context that is provided as a, as a frame or a way of curating not just the experience, but the memory of the experience as a whole. And it's just like three pictures of places that you will recognize from the British Museum, the Hamburger Bahnhof in Berlin, or the Getty Museum, where I think this, these three places are very uh, resonant in my, in my own memory, not just for what they... Um, they have to offer in terms of visual experiences, but also by the very specific ways in which the sounds of your steps are echoed in these various rooms or the various type of smells you might have from the smell of the coffee in the cafeteria in the, uh, when you cross the British Museum to the smell of the garden in the Getty. Um, and this frame, this multi-sensory frame, I think is something that is totally uh, um, left out of the discussion of what happens to digital contents, even um, if we manage to transfer them uh, online with high resolution. What we know also is that the capacity for this context to actually enrich our memory depends on the associations with our previous knowledge and our previous associations. So again, to take a, a, a narrow example, but in the case of remembering faces and voices, we'll remember faces and voices better, but if they don't match, for instance, if I present female voices, uh, female faces with male voices to people, then it will be much harder to remember than if I present them with congruent female voices. So we have also to think about this uh, um, facilitation, not as, as a kind of already made rule, that you know, we can just bring multi-sensory additions and then memory will be better. But we need to tune in into the kind of natural associations or prior experiences that uh, people might have.
This is actually uh, uh, something we did and worked on uh, at with the Tate, uh, Tate Britain at the time where it was still possible to uh, conduct large scale experiments in the, in the gallery. And what we did was to harness a very simple uh, tool available in the gallery, which is the audio guide. And it's true at the time I was, I had started this conversation being a bit uh, um, uh, sort of um, surprised that as you go through the museum, you just always experience the same voice in the audio guide. So it's always the same, usually a male voice uh, telling you all about the, the different paintings on the different contents. And it's so easy to change the voice so that you could have different sounds and different voices for different paintings or different artworks. Um, so we tried to actually harness the capacity of the brain to put together faces and voices. And we selected a series of paintings and asked people as they were going with their audio guides to just perform a little memory tech test after uh, their visit. Now, some of the paintings were presented with uh, the text, the same text recorded either in a male or female voice. Um, and sometimes the participants were experiencing the paintings with a congruency uh, between the, uh, the gender of the sitter and the gender of the audio guide. And sometimes it was incongruent. So sometimes, for instance, the, the male painting was presented to a visitor with a male voice, and sometimes it was presented um, with a female voice. And then we asked people to tell us what they remember about what they saw and also what they seen. And, in, in a way that, that we predicted, we, we show that if you put the right associations, the, 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 they, our brain is used to put faces and voices together, then not only people remember better what they saw, but also they remember better what they heard. What was even more fascinating for us was to say that the, the memory effect was very much dependent of the own subjective evaluation of how well the face and the voices were matching. There was no one uh, rule for all or one uh, size fits all. People had different experiences, for instance, of the voice they would imagine um, the character, the female character to have. And if the, the voice of the audio guide was matching, they had this better recall, which showed not only that memory is a matter of sensory cues outside, but a matter of resonance with the personal associations. I want also to go back to something that Caroline uh, mentioned, actually, that uh, uh, between, between our talks of the digital and our talks of the non-digital, there is, of course, a lot of shades of gray in the middle, which might be uh, opened by the more immersive virtual reality solutions, and there are uh, a plethora of them coming on the market. And you might say, well, you know, it's very easy to individualize the contents for the visits, for instance, of the museum with virtual reality. And it's very easy, or at least easier, to add some multisensory context. We can add smell, we can add uh, uh, motion, for instance, if you're seated in, a, in a, a chair. And you can certainly add sounds in a way which is much uh, uh, more detailed. But one question you could ask is whether the degree of immersion that we'll manage to implement will make the experience better, but especially our memory better. Is the more immersive, the more memorable? And I think this equation is usually taken for granted, but when you look at the details, actually, it's true that by adding multi-sensory sounds, smells, motion, and by adding more and more capacities to actually interact with the contents, we can improve the memory for what we experience in this intermediate uh, um, augmented reality and virtual worlds. But it's also not true that the more details we had, the better we will remember. And on the contrary, there are more studies coming showing that with more accuracy, maybe because we stop filling in as much uh, with our imagination or simply because the cognitive loads become too high, then our memory of the experience we have in virtual reality is not as high as the ones we have for the same content in real life. Um, even more uh, uh, related to what Vittorio was saying, the interactive, the active involvement of uh, our bodies with the content uh, actually matters. And here, what is important, I think this is pointing to the, the, the possible social and political significance of these findings, is that we're not talking here about the mere motor aspect, the fact that you're moving, because if you compare cases where you're, you can move in the virtual space, but under somebody's instructions. Uh, 
versus the cases when you can move under your own intentionality, then again, we see a difference in the way you remember the same contents. And this is the intentional motor behavior that really matters, not that the, the activation of the motor system per se, it's the goal directedness that uh, uh, I think was also highlighted by Vittorio in his talk. What I want to, to suggest is that immersion and virtual reality, which is presented as a solution by adding this aspect of motor involvement and more content, are actually not solutions in the sense in which the cognitive load and the lack of, of eventually, eventually of, of feeling of freedom and autonomy that we might have or the exercise of our intentionality will not uh, um, actually match the real life experience. Not to mention, of course, the problem with the fact that the more content we had and the more modality, the more likely we have to create virtual sickness in these platforms. So what about digital events? I think we all have had the experience during the, the pandemic, not just of having uh, um, experience we will remember for a long time, but also a series of experiences of events online that we have totally forgotten. I can't remember half of the Zoom meeting that I had at the beginning, when they happened, who was exactly present. And I'm really concerned about what will be forgotten here uh, um, more than what will be uh, only remembered. It's usual to distinguish between episodic memory and, and semantic memory for content, what we remember and the where and when we remember. And here we have to be worried of the powers of sort of uh, words here as, uh, as was discussed, because when we talk about digital rooms or meeting rooms, these are not rooms. This is not a space. This is a juxtaposition of connections on the web, but these digital rooms are nowhere in particular for our memories to actually fix. The digital events, of course, happen at a specific time, but they don't fit with our usual time management or time habits. We don't have to go somewhere. We don't have to actually uh, plan things ahead as we used to. So our time management means that we're, we deal with the time of, of these digital events very differently. And uh, finally, in, in line with what the studies about or, or uh, self-regulation on the screens uh, with reading shows, I think we all have experienced a lack of self-regulation with our timing on the duration we spend, we, the time we spend online. You spend 10 minutes, uh, you feel, but actually 30 minutes has passed. And, and the fact that we lose our capacity to self-regulate uh, is, I think, even more worrying and linked to this uh, fact that, that things don't actually connect as experience of content through specific events with space and time uh, framing them as well. Finally, another aspect that will uh, uh, probably explain the digital forgetting on many of these experiences is the lack of direct social bounds through this experience. So of course, we are uh, socially connected, They're, the medias are called social, but um, there is a, a key phenomenon that we know is crucial to our memory um, and our learning is actually the phenomenon of joint attention. The capacity that humans have uh, in common with some um, uh, other uh, primates, or at least it's controversial, um, from a very early age to, to realize what uh, is being jointly attended and eventually realize that the two people know that they are looking at the same thing. So pointing and realizing that you're attending to the same thing is something impossible uh, to perform online. If I point at my slides just now, you have no idea what I'm pointing at. Um, if I even use a pointer, I have no idea whether you're actually all looking at my screen. So joint attention is almost impossible online. And because of this lack of social connection, we have to remember that epistemic memory is not just a, a spatial temporal uh, memory, but also a social memory. We remember events because we want to remember with whom we share these events. And with the lack of sharing of experiences, there is also the lack of shared memories that I think we have to worry, not just in general, but really starting with the very uh, basic mechanisms through which we can engineer shared experiences and therefore engineer shared memories. So where does this leave us? Well, what I want to point at is maybe that against the tide pointing only at, at the sort of information overload that uh, um, or, or shift to uh, digital 
sphere, the, the digital spheres has generated, is that this information overload also comes with a sensory and social impoverishment. And um, um, here, I think I totally agree with what Vittorio was also showing with, with different uh, arguments and sets of evidence. But as a more philosophical conclusion, I think we, we really need to uh, discuss, or at least these are the issues I wish to put on the, on the table and, and hear uh, from you about. Uh, there is this focus on enriching the user's experience. And I talk to a lot of tech people, and it's always on this enrichment, add more modalities, add more immersive technology, add more content, add more possibility to share. Uh, but this enrichment of users' experiences is has three uh, big, uh, raises three big issues. One, which is the one I insisted on, is that if you enrich, doesn't mean that you don't have downstream consequences. You might lower people's intention, in, intentional engagement with the contents. You might make their cognitive load uh, so high that the experience they can actually remember will be less and less. Um, the second aspect is that by focusing on enriching users experience and the focus on personalization of content, then we're making also these experiences more and more individualistic and the lack of shared experience and shared memory is something we really need to attend to. And third and not last, uh, we need really to think about or, capaci or, or lessen capacity to actually curate and regulate our own memories when we go online. And we are not good at regulated our capacity for learning and experiencing and therefore we are more and more pushing this capacity toward the, the content providers and, and I think this is where maybe I have hope for some of the museums to actually take, take a, a very active role because if there's a, a set of expertise about curation of content it's coming certainly from, from the word of, of museum and galleries. Thank you for your uh, attention. <laughs>